Today we're going to talk about transactions and concurrency control. As you will see, there are going to be many things that uh, are not even documented. You are not going to find all this information in the database manual. Sometimes uh, you will discover such things by testing uh, applications and then trying to figure out why things work in a particular way. And um, as you will see, we are going to talk about many topics. And one of the first thing that I want to show you is to prove you that it's actually very easy to bump into race conditions that can have serious consequences. And that's, that's why I believe that everything that we're going to discuss about in this uh, session is very useful. Because without having proper data integrity, without having a proper concurrency control strategy, you can bump into some problems which are actually terrible. And um, I'm going to give you some real-life examples of companies that uh, got hacked because of concurrency control issues. One example is Flexcoin. Flexcoin operated in the early cryptocurrency uh, times uh, and uh, it was an electronic uh, wallet for your bitcoins. You could uh, store your bitcoins there and then you could transfer them. Because it was off-chain, the transfer would be faster and cheaper. And that was basically their business. And uh, in 2014, this company, this application, got hacked. And someone managed to steal almost 900 bitcoins. At the time, it was around $600,000. And in the post-mortem, you can only find it on Weber Hype. In the post-mortem, they say that the theft was enabled by a flaw and the attacker managed to take advantage that they didn't have a proper concurrency control strategy and they were sending simultaneous thousands of requests trying to move some coins from one account to the other and uh, they managed to get to extract more coins than they were supposed to transfer from the source account. So it looks like a data integrity issue. And this is not the only company. Around the same time, Poloniex, which is a crypto exchange, also got hacked and they lost 12% of their bitcoins using uh, a similar attack. They described it that the hacker managed to figure out that they could place simultaneous transfers from one account to another account. And because they were not uh, properly validating their balances, the attacker managed to steal uh, bitcoins they were not supposed to transfer from the source account so what are the odds of having two distinct uh, applications implemented probably with different stacks by different people being attacked in the same time and uh, being hacked using uh, a similar way and um, the attacker managed to steal some uh, some assets from from them and uh, you may think that this is something very advanced or maybe they made some terrible mistakes there and uh, it may not happen to you but i can prove you that's actually extremely easy to replicate exactly the problem that they had the whole logic is just one transfer we have two accounts a source and a destination account and uh, an amount of uh, assets they can be coins they can be money that I want to transfer from one account to the other. And the logic is very simple. Basically, you just have to read the balance from the source account. And if you have enough, uh, enough assets, money or coins there, then you need to withdraw. So you need to, to subtract that sum from the source account and you add it to the destination account. So that's uh, the logic. And we will have this test case. So I'm going to show you that Basically, the opposite is true because it's actually very easy to replicate exactly the same um, issue that affected those two distinct companies. And as you can see here, we are, we are using PostgreSQL, which is, um, which is a, a relational database that has a proper, um, proper concurrency control implementation. It's being renowned for uh, favoring integrity and uh, it's one of the favorite uh, open source relational databases that is being chosen by, uh, by developers. And we have two accounts, Alice, that has a sum of 10 
and Bob that doesn't have anything. We need to have two accounts in order to make a transfer. This is the transfer method. This is exactly the method that I showed you. And the implementation, of course, we need to see how the get and the add to account balance are implemented. They're extremely simple. Reading the balance is just a select. We are, uh, we are reading the balance from the account. And then adding the amount to the account, it's being done using a simple update. We're not using any data access framework to make it as simple as possible so that we can focus on the database concurrency control uh, issue. So we, we extract anything that uh, would um, make us uh, uh, wonder whether it's the framework or it's the database. So we'll just keep it as simple as possible. So this is just an update. We're updating the account, adding that sum, which can be negative or positive, to that account. And of course, when you implement something like that, it's uh, obvious that one of the first thing that you will do to make sure that you, you implement it properly, you are going to write an integration test. But most often our integration tests look exactly like this method. You start with some assumptions, you call transfer, transferring five from Alice to Bob. So of course, Alice should have now five and Bob should have five. You do another transfer of five. Now Alice doesn't get anything because it's five minus five, zero. And uh, Bob gets uh, five plus five, 10. And then of course, if you try to move more from Alice to Bob, it shouldn't work. You should stay in the same consistent state that you were before. So we're going to run this uh, test case and it should work. But most of the time when we write this kind of integration tests, we do it in a serial, we, we have a serial execution. That's the way that we are writing them. Because every operation is going to see exactly the state of the database that was left by the previous execution. Because we have only one thread operating. And that's not the context in which those applications got hacked. They got hacked because an attacker was sending simultaneous requests. In their case, there were thousands. In our case, we don't need thousands. We will just run 16, 16 threads. And this time, this test parallel execution, this time we're going to create 16, or we can change this number, we will create a number of threads and we will start them and they will operate the transfer. And of course, we start from the same assumption. Alice has 10, Bob gets zero, and we're going to run this transfer. And, and at the end, we want to print what is the balance for Alice and what is the balance for Bob. And of course, because we have, we have a main thread that runs this method, and then we have 16 threads that do the transfer. So whenever you have threads, you need to coordinate them. And to coordinate them, we use these two countdown latches. One, the start latch, which makes all those uh, worker threads start at once. And uh, another one, an end latch, on which the main thread waits, waiting for the worker threads to finish. That's why each worker thread towards the end, they, uh, they are counting down this latch, so that when this one reaches zero, the main thread wakes up and prints the balance. So let's run this test case because this is basically the use case that was causing the problem for those, uh, so for, for those two companies. And we can see that indeed, now Bob got more money that uh, they were supposed to get. They got 25 and now Alice has minus 15. And this is, uh, this is Postgres. And it doesn't really matter what database we're choosing. We can change this one uh, when I'm changing this to MySQL, you will see, which has a different isolation level. That's interesting. Postgres by default uses read committed. And MySQL by default uses repeatable read, which is a stronger isolation level. Uh, when we are going to run our parallel execution test, you are going, let's, let's see how it works. So let's run this test case now on MySQL. And you will see that it doesn't, it doesn't, uh, prevent the issue. So it's the same thing. No matter what database I'm going to choose, it's going to be the same. So of course there's some issue here. And in order to understand the issue, we'll have to dig down a little bit. And when we take a look here, we see that indeed we have this select balance. 
we have the update balance there. And uh, the reason why we have this issue, it doesn't really matter the isolation level. When you take a look here, you will see that the read and the write are executed in their own transactions. It's like we're running on auto commit. Although we're not running in auto commit because we're disabling and we're committing explicitly, every operation runs in its own transaction. And of course, when you have that, you don't really have ACID. So that's why it doesn't work. Now, what if we're executing this in the context of the same transaction? Because we have a test case and we're going to run the same transfer, but this time we're going to run this transfer on the same connection. Because previously that was a problem. The operations, the reads and the writes were happening in different transactions. And this time we're starting one transaction and we're executing everything using the same connection and at the end we are going to we are going to commit because everything that happens in this method here this lambda happens in the context of the same transaction so now the transfer is going to use the same transaction so when we run we are going to we have the same uh, assumption postgresql 16 threads and let's see if that's that was the problem and whether now we can uh, we can fix it and when we take a look to see what we have when we'll check the log we will see that there's there's no improvement we still have the same issue here and even if we are now executing the reads and the writes in the context of the same transaction and why it happens like that is because this issue which is called lost update in this case, it's not prevented by the default isolation level. In order to make it work, to prevent it, we'll just switch this to true, because here we will see, depending on what database we're using, we will have to choose a different isolation level. That's one method. There are other methods as well to prevent this one. But you can see here that now for Postgres, when we switch to repeatable read and we rerun the same test case, now we're we're not going to see a negative balance for Alice and we're not going to see Bob getting more than uh, 10. It can get less, but it cannot get more. Why? Because if you scroll up a little bit, you'll see that there are many serialization issues. Now the database makes sure that we're not bumping into this uh, lost update anomaly. And it's the same for MySQL. If we're running MySQL, now we will have to switch to serializable and this test is going to run on MySQL. How can you tell? You can see from the dialect here, it's on the MySQL 8 dialect behind the scenes. And now you will see that indeed you don't get a negative balance. And this time on MySQL, you got some deadlock issues because on serializable MySQL uses uh, locks. So exactly like I told you, it's actually very easy to replicate this issue. We, we may think that these kind of issues can never happen, but in reality, they can easily happen. And if there is one thing, just one thing that you can get out of this whole presentation is the fact that if you write integration tests with concurrency in mind, that's, that's going to be great because once you have those tests, you can reason about how things work and then you can find the explanation. Without it, it's very difficult. In this case, the problem is called lost update and it happens like this. You have two different users reading the account balance. They both read uh, five and now Bob makes a withdrawal and now the balance uh, goes from five to zero. But Alice doesn't know about that. So she assumes that the balance is still five. So when she withdraws a five, uh, she's going to take five out of this account. Uh, she's not taking from five. She's taking from whatever it's now on the database, which is zero. So she will get minus five. This is a lost update. And the thing is that this lost update, not only that uh, it's not documented, you're not going to find it when you read uh, the database manual, but it's not covered by the default isolation level. That's why we got it on Postgres. We got it on uh, MySQL. And uh, what's also important related to this example is that uh, it was very easy to 
to make some mistakes. And the only way we, we figured out how to make it work was after we wrote this, uh, this integration test that was using concurrency control. And uh, it's not just that in our uh, very simple example, we found a situation where things don't work uh, properly. There is something very interesting. There is a paper, this acid rain paper, uh, acid rain, that was written by Peter Bailey's. He was a professor at Stanford. And with his team, he analyzed various open source e-commerce applications. They were analyzing many of them from Java, from uh, Ruby, from Python. And uh, when they were testing them, they discovered that uh, some had more issues, other had less issues, only one didn't have an issue. So what it tells you, it tells you that even if the projects were open source and you could have uh, millions of people reviewing the source code for those applications, in the end, they still got issues. Why? Because this whole concept is very difficult to just reason about, reason about it. That's why you need those uh, uh, integration tests. And now let's go back to what we're most of the time when we're developing applications, we're using uh, relational databases, we're using SQL, and we know that they have transactions. And what's interesting is that they always use transactions even when we don't declare them. If you don't declare a transaction, then the scope of the transaction is the statement itself. So you have auto commit mode. When you declare the transactions, you declare the boundaries where it starts, and then you have multiple statements executing in the context of the same transaction. It was the case in our second example. And then at the end, you do a commit or a rollback. You end the transaction. So you define the boundaries. And that's when you have a transaction that spans over multiple statements. If you like this video, you are going to love my high performance SQL video course. For more details, go to my blog, blogmihalcha.com, and check out the courses page. If you're struggling with data access performance issues, this video course will teach you how to get the most out of your relational database. You have unlimited access to the course material and 14 days money back warranty. If you are curious what other people think about the video course lessons, then you should definitely read the testimonials I got from my students. Thank you for watching this video and enjoy running your data access layer at high speeds.